All right, so we are going into the Scott Peterson case, okay? And uh, a uh, this was totally unplanned. You covered the Scott Peterson case just very briefly last week. Yeah, breaking news, like just about the Innocent Project taking it up. That was it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we got so many comments, so many polarizing opinions, so many people split down the aisle yeah. uh, that... I knew we had to dig into it, right? Because as I'm reading a lot of these comments and, and trying to reply, I, I straight up told everyone, like, I, I need to learn more about this. I don't even know. I have no clue how I feel about it, you know? Um, what What's interesting, a, a few people said they had issues like, oh, before you should talk on something, you should do research on it. And they're talking about the Innocence Project because it's the Los Angeles Innocence Project, not like the National Innocence Project. But okay. What does that have to do with anything? Different company, uh, same goals. So sure, it's the Los Angeles Innocence Project. Uh, it, again, it doesn't change anything. I, the only thing I can think of why it people might have had problems with it is because I said that that innocence project usually doesn't pick up a case unless they know like already ahead of time, something's wrong here. Not maybe not kind of, they know that someone is innocent, uh, and being held, you know, um, I don't know if Los Angeles innocence project works like that, but, uh, it was at least enough for me to want to dig into what was going on here. Right. And uh, it, I wasn't watching true crime at the time that I started uh, that this case was going on. So for me, it was fresh eyes into this topic. And I watched a couple different content creators. One of them here is uh, is was really, really, really good. And where is it? I thought I had it pulled up and ready to go here, but apparently not. Um Behind Criminal Minds. So the content creator behind Criminal Minds, based on everything that I heard from this, this video, um, it sounds like he has some kind of legal background. It sounds like he might have been a defense attorney at one time or worked closely with investigators, something along those lines. But uh, he had a lot of really good information, a lot of objectively factual information. And this video that I watched came out uh, 11 months ago. And it says, Scott Peterson, the true story you were never told, a tale of two stories. So he talks about how many people are starting to believe in Scott Peterson's innocence when at first, when this for story first broke, um, no one thought he was innocent. Nobody. And, um, it, it's interesting because we just talked about this the other night about the impact of a few people going out there and continuously posting all over the internet, the same comments that bring up questions and the potential power behind those people. Well, and a trial by media. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm not coming at this case from thinking he's innocent. I, I don't, if I am, if I'm forced to commit, I think he's guilty. Uh, but I don't have all the information. I do not think he's innocent. Um, but I don't know, you know, that's just a guesstimate here. Um, now, so when I went into it, um, I just wanted to know the objective facts, right? So who is Scott Peterson? For anyone that might not know, Scott Peterson was convicted in 2014 for the murder of his wife, Lacey Peterson, and their unborn son, Connor, while uh, the prosecution presented a case that convinced the jury there have been discussions and claims regarding potential evidence against Scott Peterson or concerns about the trial. Uh, it's important to note that, uh, oh yeah. Um, but anyway, so 
going into the evidence, right? I wanted to know objectively. Tell me the objective facts of this case. I don't want to know all the opinion. I don't want to know uh, the subjective natured evidence. Um, so I started looking into it and and trying to figure out like what the prosecution led with, right? Do, do you remember any of it? Um, most of what I remember is circumstantial evidence. So it's a very heavily circumstantial case. It However, is. that is one thing that people that are fighting for his innocence love to use. Um, and I'm here to say that some of the strongest cases in the world have been also, uh, have been, um, all subjective, whatever, no, evidence. just circumstantial. Or circumstantial evidence. Yeah, sorry, I was reading while I was talking. But um, some of the strongest cases in the world have been circumstantial evidence. Yeah. Yeah, circumstantial doesn't necessarily mean bad. It It doesn't. So, but it's interesting that it's used in that way. It's interesting that the A&E documentary leans on that like it's a bad thing when I mean it's not no but I mean obviously the ideal is not just circumstantial but circumstantial cases can be very 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 strong but they can also be very very weak I, so can direct evidence no yeah it can no Direct uh, is yeah. direct is literally the ideal because there's no other possibility. No, it, and unless we're talking about literal video, but most evidence that is direct to a person, there there doesn't normally answer the question of how it got there. Unless right, you that's have supporting the video. definition of circumstantial. That's why DNA is circumstantial. Yeah, yeah, I. I get that, but that's not how it's being portrayed in this case. What they're saying is that there, there's no forensic evidence, and that ends up not being true. Okay. So, sure, for direct evidence, I mean, yeah, you can use the definition as that, but uh, I think direct is anything that has a connection with the suspect. But yes, if it if the item can move, then you're right. It it can be classified as circumstantial evidence. It is. I yeah. But they, that's why it's not necessarily bad. It falls under two categories, is what I'm getting at. Because if it's direct, it ties directly to that person, but it can also be circumstantial. Yeah. Okay. So I guess. Uh, I mean, unless you have a different definition. No, I, I don't think it matters. I mean, I do think it matters here because this case is a case about media coverage. You have one side that is saying, oh, shame on you for offering a trial by media while both sides are doing the same thing. Yeah. They're literally doing the same thing. But to be fair, if the media has attacked you and there's been a trial by media conducted and it's your character and you're the one that has to be in prison for it and say you are innocent, I would go out and do it in the media and want everybody to know that I'm innocent and so, put all of that out there because they, they destroyed my character. They made me look guilty. Like I want my side of the story out there. If see, they're going to put theirs out there. I don't agree. Uh, because I don't think that he was convicted because of the media. I really don't. Um, I think that we minimize the intelligence of our jurors by assuming that they can't be impartial to the information that's coming out of the media. Uh, I know that if I went into a case and, um, you know, it, say I went into be a jury member in the Idaho four case, uh, I, absolutely could be unbiased absolutely i could be unbiased 
So to think that jury members can't do that, um, I don't know. We're we're kind of minimizing them as people. Like, yeah, but you're, you're also not intelligent enough to be unbiased and understand the concept that uh, everything that you've heard in the media is up in the air, whether it's true or not. Um, and uh, understanding that you need to look at the facts of the case and not the facts of Fox or MSNBC or whatever. Yeah, I, I agree with you to an extent, but I also think that the subconscious is also minimized a lot that people don't realize what they're taking in every day and what can bias them without them realizing it because a lot of people are biased and it's not on purpose. It's unintentional because that's how human brains work. Maybe. I don't know. I just don't agree. Um, I, I have a lot more faith in people to be able to manage that. I don't think that. I think that they at least seem to have a very intentional effort with jurors to, which I think they do most of the times, um, to, to make sure that they know how to check their bias at the door and that they're capable of that. Because I do think we've seen bias juries before. Yeah, I I think bias juries happen and they normally get called out and found out. And it was actually in the Scott Peterson case where there was a jury member that uh, ended up having some kind of and this actually helps Scott Peterson in this case. But there was a jury member that they called like red, some red cupcake, red velvet, something like that, because she had what? like bright red hair and uh uh, it, it it was found out later that she had a background in um, so she was part of a relationship and that relationship was abusive uh, and it had to do with a child and Scott Peterson's uh, defense attorneys look at her and say, you know, we didn't know this information at that time that created uh, a biased jury member because she was too easily to to relate to. Uh, Lacey as a person because she went through those things herself. You know what I mean? Oh, that's a pretty big deal, though. Like, yeah. they should have known about that and not had her on the she jury. Lied. She lied? She lied. Yep. So, uh, I agree with you. That is a very big deal. It's a very big deal when you take into account um, her outward personality as well. So, um. All right, so let's dig into some of the stuff, and, and we'll just talk through it piece by piece. So we'll, we'll start with the story of what we were told. I don't want to give this whole thing in story fashion because I think the details around the evidence and concerns is, is what is important. So as we said, Scott Peterson was convicted in 2004. To give you guys a brief rundown of the prosecution story, right? This is what the prosecution believed happened. Um, you have Scott Peterson, who was home with his wife. Um, Scott Peterson was having a child. Lacey was eight and a half months pregnant. Um, and he, he didn't want to have a child. He, he didn't want any kids. Um, he wanted to live a more partying, freeing lifestyle, um, and, and didn't want to be tied down. And Lacey did, uh, he was known for having multiple mistresses on the side, which he did have at that time. But, uh, ultimately what, what came to a head is, um, you know, one night they aren't sure if it happened at night or early in the morning. Um, they believe that he strangled her, um, and that it was planned. He bought a boat, uh, a few days earlier and bought uh, a fishing license that was only good for these two select days. He bought a boat, even though they didn't have finances to support that boat. So it was bought with intention. Okay. Um, then some days later, she is, you know, passed away, gone missing. And again, this is the prosecution story. Um, now Scott Peterson loads her up in his truck. 
they he goes to his office where this is like backstory cover uh and he does work on his work computer and whatnot and then he goes to the bay and uh they believe that he loaded her up on the boat and took off and uh you know while at home they believe that he created anchors for her uh to to make sure the body sank they believe due to how the body was found that anchors were applied to each arm and each leg um and her body was found because of the you know pulling and what happens when you're underwater things like that um things just come apart right 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 and he goes back home uh, and starts setting this whole thing up. And interesting, the first thing he does, because he was quote-unquote fishing, um, is washes his clothes and takes a shower before anything else. That is the number one first thing he does when he gets home. Um, then he says he realizes, like, oh, shoot, Lacey's car is in the driveway. Um, and they had plans to go to her parents' house that night. So he calls her parents and uh, asks if Lacey's there. and she's not uh so he he says to them well lacy must be missing then so they uh call the police her parents do not scott her parents uh call the police her dad in particular and and file her as a missing person uh the police come over to scott's house they start going through the motions and things like that and uh they start digging into scott immediately and um some days later in the investigation um they end up finding scott said he went you know to the marina went boating or whatever they start asking him questions about his fishing they find lie after lie after lie after lie after lie after lie literally more lies than you can count yeah. you guys uh, and and there are people that are claiming his innocence right now that say, well, he was only lying about the uh, affair, okay, because he was scared about being portrayed as, you know, being a bad guy. However, that's not true. He lied about what he was fishing for. Those fish were not in season, and he did not have a fishing license for them. He said he was using these specific lures well, the, when the police got to him, those lures are still in the package and had never been used and or opened up. Um, he uh, told them that he bought a 90-pound bag of concrete. I don't remember if he told them that or if they fi figured it out. But he said that with that 90-pound bag of concrete, he created an anchor. Uh, anchor singular. Um, and uh, that anchor weighed eight pounds. Okay. Re 90 into eight uh where's the other concrete they couldn't find it but they found residue on the boat of uh of concrete and uh interesting also is while they were looking through his fishing stuff and this is this is the forensic evidence where people that believe he's innocent um and again, I don't know. I'm just more likely to lean towards guilt, but I, I'm not 100 on that. I'm like 60% he's guilty, okay? Could very easily go back the other way if I, I found more information. But when they were looking through his fishing stuff, they found these pliers. These pliers that have hair and DNA of Lacey Peterson in them, in the boat, with concrete on them. Like, you guys, I, I have such a hard time hearing all of this because this is objective evidence this is not subjective this is objective evidence that is and was proven with photographs with evidence with uh the the non-opinionated details okay take all that into account and like try and help me understand here like okay now on top of it I forget how long it was because I'm more interested in like the compare and contrast here. But a few weeks or months later, her body washes up along with her sons. That was eight and a half months. And I'm, I'm not going to get into the details of that, but there's also evidence with that too, talking about they believe that she ended up birthing him somehow, some way. And, and some other details that, that, don't lean towards his innocence or guilt. So 
Um, but if you're interested in it, definitely go watch that video I talked about. I'll link it in the description. Um, but the bodies are found eight miles from where he pushed off from in the boat. Now to give the flip here, right? People that believe he's innocent say, well, sure, somebody that kidnapped her and ended her would very easily be able to watch the TV and see that the police were saying that he was out that day. So they knew where to drop the body. You're right. There is absolutely that possibility. But um, the prosecution stated that it looked like they both had been in water for a very long time, including the missing limbs. That only happens when you're submerged underwater with things happening and and whatnot. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I do know what you mean. It yeah, I, I think it was it was consistent with that for sure. Now, the physical evidence of the bodies was yeah. consistent with being underwater all the time. But people that are innocent believe it's very easily they could have put the bodies there. And I agree they could have, but they still would have had to be underwater. And that's right. what makes it hard. Now, when they found the body, you know, the police asked Scott for her dental records to confirm because the body were in such bad shape was her body was in such bad shape. And he refused. He refused. He refused to give them her dental records. Then they said, okay, well, you can't find him, whatever. Uh, then where did she, where was her dentist? Uh, he couldn't remember. And you know what's interesting? Hmm. And this is all confirmed, you guys. Like, you can go verify everything I'm saying. Uh, him and her, for many years, had been going to the same dentist. <laughs> Look, I know a lot of people that watch us believe he's innocent, but I have I'm having a very hard time like understanding how Did you watch the documentary? I watched the A&E documentary. It's all subjectivity. That's why I'm I just don't have a lot of faith in it. There is nothing in there. No objective evidence, not a single piece. I there can't is some now maybe, but I want to be clear and I'm going to get to that. Uh but there is no objective evidence in it. Yeah, I I watched it a long time ago uh, when it first came out, and I can't honestly. I need to go back and watch it because I can't remember. But I remember leaving it thinking, "Hmm, that's interesting. Maybe, maybe there's a possibility he's innocent." But I do remember what you're saying that it was pretty subjective, and there wasn't like anything concrete. Like they did a great job. They did do a good job pitching the subjective arguments they did. and I'm going to get into that I am um because I think it's important to emotions are so great <laughs> and can be so misleading at the same time you know what I mean yeah so okay let's get into it so for that with all the new information here and here I have this document as well and this takes you through what they got here okay so number one is this is a very, very big one. So uh, a house across the street from the Peterson's home was burglarized around the same time Lacey disappeared. Uh, Peterson's attorney says the burglars could have kidnapped and ended Lacey. Two of the burglars were later, later caught and interviewed by police. The burglars denied having anything to do with Lacey. Okay, now there's more to that. All right. Okay. So. Uh, according to a sheriff, right? Um, there were people that there were these two guys that were arrested that, uh, one of them was talking from the jail to somebody, to some big shot leader type guy in their crime group, whatever. And they were talking about Lacey, the sheriff said, and they made a suggestion that, you know, um, Hey, they keep bringing this up about Lacey, yada, 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 and making suggestive comments that the, the person on the other line could have something to do um, with the uh, with the crime. Um, and uh, the uh, the sheriff wrote it down and, and took it down or whatever, um, but they can't find that recording anymore. It's gone. So 
Um, oh. That's subjective, right? Now, let's go to 11 eyewitnesses saw Lacey Peterson walking her dog in the black pants, white shirt, get up or whatever. Um, this is very good evidence. So those 11 eyewitnesses were all here at the time of his trial. Do you know how many got called up? How many? None. His defense attorneys chose to use none of them during the trial. And do you know why? Why? Because all their statements contradicted each other. What? Yeah. Now, there is a claim that an eyewitness saw Lacey Peterson saw a pregnant woman hop out of a van, pop a squat on the side of the street, urinate, and then someone pull her back in the van. Um, again, no evidence of this. They're saying eyewitness. Lacey Peterson's dad put out like a half million dollar reward at that time, okay? When a large reward is like that, eyewitness findings tend to come up. You know what I mean? People are actively looking. Now, um, so are those things possible? They are. But here's the important thing, you guys, is there is no direct evidence of that. Another piece they say is that the mailman delivered mail that day and the dog didn't bark. And the mailman said the dog always barked, always barked when the mailman came, but they didn't that day. Therefore, that's evidence that Lacey Peterson was out and walking her dog. I mean... Yeah, but you know that I heard that she wasn't supposed to be walking. Yeah, well, she quit walking according to her physician well, three weeks earlier. Her doctor told her not to anymore. Yeah, because she had an incident where she almost passed out. Yeah, yep. and he, he, she was told not to do it anymore. So the likelihood and she went walking by herself when she cared so much about this kid is is very slim on top of it, but that is a subjective piece of evidence so i wasn't going to bring it up but you're right yeah 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 um gosh i lost my point but yeah so uh the 11 eyewitnesses right the dog barking i don't have an answer for the dog barking i don't not a good answer the one thing that i could suggest is maybe the dog was in a different room i've had dogs my whole life and a dog is not a catch all there are times where dogs are asleep and hard asleep and miss things like they do not hear absolutely everything at all times, always. Um, so could that be a situation? Maybe I don't know. Or maybe there's more to that. I don't know because there's no objective evidence because we don't know where the dog was there. All we know is there wasn't mm -hmm. barking. According yeah, to an eyewitness account, that doesn't mean the dog wasn't home. That doesn't mean the dog wasn't down the street. That doesn't mean anything of any of those things. You know what I mean? Or Scott Peterson did it. And that's why the dog was out because the dog got out somehow while he was doing all this while stuff. he was loading her body or something. I know. I know. I wasn't going to go there because it's subjective, but okay. So here's the new. Sorry, evidence, I keep going guys. to the subjective while you're trying to stay objective. Here's. Here is the new evidence. According to investigators in the defense, there was a suspicious van fire, okay? And people are drawing this connection with the case. So on Christmas 2002, the day after Lacey was reported missing, a suspicious van caught on fire less than a mile from the Peterson's home, court documents oh. state. The van appeared to have been intentionally ignited to cover up a crime court documents show. So the uh, investigative fire chief person that investigated this said that there's a, a mattress in the back with blood on it. That blood was never tested. Oh, that, no. That van is a mile and a half away from the home. So the defense is making very, very big assumptions here that this van, which is already in a bad area that is known for a crime area, is trying to suggest that blood in the back is Lacey's, whereas, yes, they need the, that blood tested. They do. They absolutely do. Um. However, it hasn't been tested yet, meaning 
There's no confirmation she was in that van yet, you guys. So there are we don't know so if it has anything people, to do with anything. Nothing. And you, you know how many people have already left comments saying like, um, yeah, it, she she was clearly in the van. Like people are committed to this van story already when we haven't gotten the evidence yet. Wait, is the van still around? Is the mattress covered in blood still around to be tested? I there's requests in and there's a pretty large document with a huge table here that I started reading through and I'm going to continue reading through it. I just wanted to touch on this because okay. it seems so important to uh, our viewers um, and go through the evidence that I was able to find without digging into the defense's book because one, a defense is usually subjective in general. Um, most of the time, not always, but uh, yeah. If yeah. we need to do a part two in this, we will. Because again, like, I don't want anyone to who watches us to feel like they're cl they're closed minded and their minds already made up. He's guilty. They they won't be able to open their eyes. That's not true. That's not true at all. I'm looking at the situation and I'm weighing. I'm using my own personal scales yeah. to weigh the likelihood between. The innocent story and the guilty story. And right now, the guilty story has more weight to it. The fact that he went fishing for fish that were not in season and it was impossible. The fact that he says he used that day fishing lures that were never opened and they were still in the packaging. The fact that there is 80 pounds of missing concrete, which if they were eight pound, things he would have just enough for you know arms body and throw over yeah. like yeah it the math gets close you guys gets very close you guys mm -hmm. um the lying i didn't even bring up the mistress right because the mistress doesn't offer direct evidence right. not anything objective it they got close very fast like very very fast so does it look like a Watts situation? Absolutely. It feels like a Chris Watts situation. Um, although this was before Chris Watts, but like Very, when I'm looking at yeah. this, that's how it feels. He found someone and he has this rush of endorphins. He already didn't want a child and he figured out a way out. Like it fits. He had the motive. He had the means. He had the opportunity. He was the last person to see her. He was out in that Bay Area where the body was found. Like, that's a lot. That is a lot of real objective evidence. And another thing that the defense says, and then we'll wrap it up, is they say that they have targeted him from the beginning. You know that the the prosecution has proof that they did deep background searches into every single person in that family and every single person that had encountered her within the whole weeks leading up to it? Really? Yeah, they did not target him. However, I just want to be fair that I would be okay if they did. And the reason being is because statistically, it, it is like over 70% most of the time, the husband, the boyfriend, the lover. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that's the first place you should always look, especially with when you have a crime like this, where it's a pregnant woman who's about to give birth going missing. Like Andy is a, a mistress, and then the mistress they look at him and see cracks, like never ending, well, you getting know, bigger cracks. You know that he... um he would lie like he completely lied about who he was to his mistress, like claiming he was in Paris and traveling he, when he really he, wasn't. He got a fake uh, degree for yeah. one of his mistress. Like he went really far lengths to be, you know, what whatever. he wanted to appear and to be. Don't forget just before we close this out. When he got arrested, he got arrested with $15,000. He got arrested with a whole ton of sleeping pills and uh, and Viagra pills. He got arrested with... And the sleeping pills, I wondered personally, I haven't heard anyone say this. Why would you have that many sleeping pills? Were these sleeping pills used before ending her? 
to make it easier. Oh. You know, why would you have all these? I don't know. But $15,000 changed his entire look, grew a goatee, bleached everything, was hiding out with fifteen grand, an unmarked phone, and maps ready to go, dude. Like, you guys, if evidence proves that this van is tied to her, Listen, I, I think that the scales would probably be very, 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 very close. But right now, my scale says it is more likely that he's guilty because of objective evidence, not subject. But I want to know what you guys think. Let me know what you think. If you think he's innocent, share where I'm missing things. You know, leave them in the comments. Let me know. And uh, we'll talk about it soon. Yeah, I'm curious what the Innocence Project, uh, the LA Innocence Project, is going to drum up out of this. Like, what are they, what are they going to come up with other than what you just mentioned? Yeah, yeah. Let me know.